Good afternoon. Can you hear me all right? Thanks so much, everyone, for joining us this afternoon for our program. My name is Eliza Canty Jones, and I work here at the Oregon Historical Society. It's traditional here at the Oregon Historical Society to do a land acknowledgement at the beginning of our programs. And this is something that a lot of folks are doing and we're learning a lot more about. I was at an event last night. I want to give credit to Dr. Christine Dupree, who really spoke at length about land acknowledgements. She's Cowlitz, and um, some of what she was saying really got me thinking. And so some of what I want to say with um, our acknowledgement is just to encourage everyone to take time to learn about the peoples who have lived in the place that's now Portland, where we are today for thousands and thousands of years, to think about the vast variety of languages and cultures that were practiced and spoken in this place. This was one of the most heavily populated places in North America and has, was for thousands of years with a lot of different peoples. And, and many of those peoples are gathered today at Salettes and Grand Ronde and other tribes that continue to practice their sovereignty. And some folks um, do not have sovereign uh, federal recognition. So we just want to take some time to think about the violence and trauma that attended all of that and also the survival and thriving uh, nature of the indigenous peoples uh, of Portland. We're gonna hear about other Oregon indigenous peoples here today as well, thanks to our speaker, but just encourage everyone to spend time thinking about that and, and learning as much as you can. There's incredible resources. Our mission here at the Oregon Historical Society is to preserve our state's history and make it accessible to everyone in ways that advance knowledge and inspire curiosity about all the peoples, places, and events that have shaped Oregon. Uh, we do that work in a lot of ways. The foundation of our work is our research library, which holds uh, unique collections related to the history of the Oregon country. If you are planning to visit the research library, get your research in by the end of the year. We'll be closing after December 28th for a major renovation of the research library that'll take place next year. So the collections will be accessible beginning in about early to mid-March at an off-site location, but it won't be as easy. So if you've got some research you've been putting off, make sure to take advantage of that. It's open to the public and there's never a charge to do research in our research library. We publish the Oregon Historical Quarterly. Uh, we'll publish the final issue of our 120th volume year next month, uh, which we're pretty excited about. We have online resources, the Oregon Encyclopedia and the Oregon History Project. Um, we have a museum, obviously. And today's program is one of a series in honor of our new core exhibition, Experience Oregon. How many folks have been upstairs to see Experience Oregon already? What do you think? Yeah, two thumbs up, <laughs> lots of waving. Thanks, we appreciate that. That work, uh, that, uh, that exhibition was a lot of work and it involved a lot of community partners. Uh, we were really honored to be able to work with all nine of Oregon's federally recognized tribes as well as many other scholars um, and community knowledge holders from across the state. So that exhibition's gonna be here for a while, take time to get to know it. All of the programs that we have created as part of this Experience Oregon series are being recorded. They're on our YouTube channel and they'll be on our website so you can access this again and again and share it with your friends, classmates, all of that kind of thing. Um, I do wanna just take a moment to acknowledge all of the folks who make our work possible, our members, our volunteers, our donors, uh, there are uh, individual donors and corporate donors and foundations that make our work possible. Everyone who pays taxes in the state of Oregon, we're supported by the state, we really appreciate that. And the residents of Multnomah County have now voted twice to enact a modest property tax levy on themselves to support OHS and historical societies in East Multnomah County. Thank you so much, Multnomah County voters, and please make sure to always take advantage of your free admission and your reductions in membership costs. We really appreciate that stable, predictable support. So I am really uh, thrilled and honored uh, that today's speaker has agreed to come and speak with us. Um, I was at an incredible uh, symposium about the Warm Springs Treaty um, at the museum, uh, the Warm Springs Museum with Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs Indian Reservation about a year ago. And I heard uh, Kathy Shayhill speak and just was really excited by what she had to say. And so thank you very much for accepting the invitation to come speak with us. 
Kathleen Hill is a Klamath tribal citizen of Modoc, Klamath, and Big Pine Paiute descent, is self-employed as a writer, researcher, consultant, and public speaker. Hill did the archival research and writing for the Klamath tribe's successful restoration of federal recognition effort. After restoration, she was elected to serve in tribal government. Motivated by her experiences, she returned to the University of Washington, completed her BA, JD, and LLM. She served as the first EPA Region 10 Tribal Office Director, developing government-to-government -government relationships with the 267 federally recognized tribes in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Alaska, before accepting an assistant professor position in the Native American Studies Department of Humboldt State University in Arcata, California. She and her husband, Dr. Joseph Dupree, subsequently created EPA's National Tribal Water Council. Kathleen is a published writer of fiction and nonfiction, including The Salila Wave, Indians, Salmon, and the Law on the Columbia River, co-authored with Dr. Dupree, and William H. Rogers, Jr. She served on the 2013 to 2016 Klamath Tribal Council and is currently serving a second term on the Oregon Institute of Technology Board of Trustees. Please join me in welcoming Kathy Shea-Hill. Wakli Sad, Gawasasis, Galiks, Sanawats, Ne Am, Bosasawaks, Kane, Ge, Ne Murak Point, Dot Chia. So, welcome to all of you. How are you doing today? I am, oh, actually, how my son would say it. It's, and he's a linguist, is uh, how are y'all? That's how he, would, how he would interpret it. Uh, this is the first time I've ever used the name that was given to me by an elder who's long passed. It was given to me in the year 2000. And um, I'm I was really nervous saying it because, um, I don't know, it seems not humble, but the name she gave me was Strong Woman. And, um, the next part is about the fact that I am from Chiloquin and I live at Modoc Point now. So uh, where are we at? Before we go any further, I wanted to, uh, I heard that there was some concern about the term Indian white relations, the use of the term Indian. And we know that that has, boy, that's waned back and forth uh, the last multiple decades about whether it's appropriate to call ourselves Indians or whether it's politically correct because, of course, the people from India are Indians. But we also, um, Eliza and I had a small conversation. The area of law that covers us is federal Indian law. Our treaty is with us as the Klamath Indian tribes. And so the term Indian, though, politically incorrect in many instances, uh, still has a use in our uh, society. So I just wanted to address that. And um, you ready for the next slide? <clears throat> so how many of you are familiar with this song by Carly Simon? It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, was, uh, I would like to have had incorporated it into my PowerPoint. And I tried to, but, the, but I'm, I'm not very Technolo technologically s savvy, so I could, I could upload the whole song, but I couldn't upload just that verse that I wanted, so instead I just typed it in. And um, so even though this, for those of you who remember this song, even though the tune is catchy, I've always been frustrated by the lyrics, because at least from my perspective, it makes no sense to call a person so vain for recognizing that a song is about him or her. I mean, it just didn't make sense to me. Uh, so when I was invited to make this presentation, I reflected not only on the experiences of my tribes, the Klamath, Modoc, and Paiute that comprise the Klamath tribes, but on the long-term relationships between Indians, Native people, and non-Indians in the United States. And I should say that's another way that I have used the term Indian and non-Indian for many decades. It's a definer of us, in a sense, and it's a a definer of who is not us. Um, 
But the long-term relationships I've characterized as conflicted, contorted, and some might say schizophrenic. And Carly Simon's illogical words seem to fit. Because somehow, native issues in this country have rarely been about natives as much as they have been about the desires, goals, and values of non-natives. So it's a little scary saying these things because I always know I'm offending somebody, but I uh, am speaking from the heart here and from my personal head. Uh, so I guess this talk is as much about non-natives as, as it is about natives, and it is not vain of the non-natives here to think so. So I want to start out by going over some history. And I'm sorry if this is way too basic for some people, but um, I, I think that we need to touch on some of the very basis from the beginning of our relationships with one another. So at early contact, Spain, Holland, France, and Britain recognized the sovereignty of the native nations in what would later be recognized as the Northeastern United States. Those nations negotiated dozens of treaties with native nations prior to the American Revolution. And, and that the picture is, is of one of those articles of peace. In 1778, before the 1783 Peace Treaty of Paris was signed by representatives of the new Confederation of the United States and Great Britain, the newly established nation had already entered into a treaty with the Delaware, or Lenape. By 1787, when the Confederation Congress of the United States adopted the Northwest Ordinance, an additional six treaties had already been negotiated with sovereign native nations. The Northwest Ordinance articulated the process for admitting new states and included a Bill of Rights for citizens. It also addressed how the newly established nation would deal with native tribes. And this is a quote from it. The utmost good faith shall always be observed towards the Indians. Their lands and property shall never be taken from them without their consent. And in their property, rights, and liberty, they never shall be invaded or disturbed unless in just and lawful war authorized by Congress. But laws founded in justice and humanity shall from time to time be made for preventing wrongs being done to them and for preserving peace and friendship with them. So that is how it was expected to be in the beginning. Fewer than four decades later, in 1823, the United States backed off of the idea that Indian lands were actually lands that belonged to the Indians. Instead, the Supreme Court determined that Indian tribes were only the rightful occupants of their lands. And then this quote, this, they, Indian tribes, were admitted to be the rightful occupants of the soil with a legal as well as just claim to retain possession of it. But their rights to complete sovereignty were necessarily diminished and denied by the original fundamental principle that discovery gave exclusive title Oops, typo, to those who made it. So this original fundamental principle, it's like, where did that come from? It was pulled out of the air? You know, who knew about this original fundamental principle? Certainly the native nations didn't know that. And of course, we also know that the discovery pertained to Christian nations. And since natives weren't Christian nations, these other nations could discover us. In other words, the United States was in charge. Seven years later, President Andrew Jackson and the US Congress were abrogating treaties in order to remove Cherokee and other, the Cherokee and other tribes from the land they had reserved to themselves. And that's another thing that's really critical that people understand. So often you hear people say, the United States gave them that reservation. It's like the United States didn't give us any of that land. We reserve that to ourselves. So that's, there's a reason to call it a reservation. But history matters. It does not change the past, but it adds depth and context as we move forward. Most Americans have heard about the infamous Cherokee Trail of Tears, 
but few know that there were some non-Indians who strongly opposed the Indian Removal Act because they saw it for the wrong that it was. Following are a few excerpts from an 1830 speech Senator Theodore Frelinghuysen of New Jersey made to his fellow U.S. Senators. God in his providence planted these tribes on this western continent so far as we know before Great Britain herself had a political existence. We have crowded the tribes upon a few miserable acres. It is all that is left to them of their once boundless forests. And still, like the horse leech, our insatiated cupidity cries, give, give. Now, when they have nothing left with which to satisfy our cravings, we propose to annul every treaty and by violence and perfidy, drive the Indian from his home. Senator Frelinghuysen's full speech lasted six hours. In the end, the United States Senate passed the Indian Removal Act by a vote of 28 to 19, and the House of Representatives passed it by a vote of 102 to 97. It was signed into law on May 26, 1830. Two years later, in Worcester versus Georgia, Supreme Court Justice John Marshall, who wrote that earlier decision that we uh, shared, said, America, separated from Europe by a wide ocean, was inhabited by a distinct people, divided into separate nations, independent of each other and of the rest of the world, having institutions of their own and governing themselves by their own laws. The Cherokees acknowledge themselves to be under the protection of the United States and of no other power. Protection does not imply the destruction of the protected. And my response is, so he said. The disregard for native nation sovereignty grew more brazen as settler colonizers pushed westward seeking the more, more, more that Senator Frelinghuysen said Native nations were expected to give, give. The disregard for indigenous sovereignty continued to be reflected in the laws and policies that followed. So even though Native nations were, from the beginning, legally recognized as sovereign, non-Native systems of power came to dominate and intrude into nearly every aspect of Native nations and the lives of Native people. When I drafted the language for this presentation, one of the questions I asked was, why have Native people been forced not to be who we were created to be and who we were for thousands of years? I think Senator Freilinghausen already answered that question. The settler colonizers and U.S. government wanted more, and we were in the way. When outright genocide was not acceptable for one reason or another, non-natives established Euro-American legal remedies to get what they wanted. And how were we, the people who make up the Klamath tribes, forced not to be who we were created to be? I'll take a shot at answering that question. I won't dwell on the encroachments, massacres, and so forth. We all know they took place, and at least on the tribal side, we know that those non-natives who engaged in such events were unpunished and were often celebrated as heroes. We also know that the vast majority of Indian white history taught in schools and perpetuated by novels, movies, and television shows have soft-pedaled soft history to justify such actions. But even after getting past such atrocities, even after entering treaties and other agreements that ceded hundreds of millions of acres to the United States, tribal nations were denied the right to govern ourselves as policy after policy was adopted by Congress in an effort to, as Major Pratt allegedly said, kill the Indian to save the man and to get our resources. As for the Klamath tribes, even after ceding over 20 million acres in the Klamath Treaty of 1864, we were expected to emulate white, emulate white people. There is nothing wrong with adapting when people choose to do so. Our people were used to hard work 
and found ways to make up for the resources that went away with the cession of 20 million acres. Some people cut rails and posts, others wove baskets and sold them, so others worked as laborers on white folks' farms. But we weren't given an opportunity to adapt on our own terms. White clothing was issued and expected to be worn, long hair was cut short, native names were disallowed, and new English-based names were assigned. Tribal police under the control of the Indian agents were sent around to enforce farming activities, whether people wanted to farm or not. And then there were the schools. The Klamath Treaty includes a commitment to build a manual labor school and pay for two school teachers for 20 years. In 1873, Indian agent Dyer advocated that Klamath tribal children be taken from their native haunts of degradation and clothed, fed, and taught the habits and arts of civilization. Some parents allowed their children to pursue the education offered. But after 1885, when eight of the 19 tribal students sent to a boarding school in Forest Grove died there, most parents opposed having their children go away to school. As a result, schools were established on the reservation. According to Dr. Theodore Stern, physical abuse was not uncommon in the schools. In 1890, a matron at the Klamath Agency School was known to inflict scars on different parts of the bodies of schoolgirls school and even upon their faces and heads. And in 1891, a superintendent teacher at the Yannick School was commended for maintaining discipline even though he resorted to shackles for challenging students. Eradication of native languages was another federal policy. As one Klamath tribal member reported in 1953, in school they didn't allow us to talk Klamath. We were punished if they caught us talking in Klamath. They would make us hold up, hold up a stick with our hands high. Sometimes make an older boy hold a fence rail on his back and walk around a tree stump. Sometimes I would see the teacher or principals whip a boy with a good sized willow. Sometimes they would make the boy take off his shirt and then the boy would never get over it. Many of the boarding schools also engaged in something called outings that required native students to work for local white people. Boys generally did agriculture or carpentry labor Girls were sent to do housekeeping and laundry for white households. And I, I remember my, both of these, actually, the outings. There was a, a woman who was my dad's friend, and they'd both been to boarding schools. My dad's family, he was able to come home, but she was sent out every summer to work in somebody in a white family's household. And she talked about how lucky he was that he got to come home. And my grandma talked about it when she, and she went, she was sent to a boarding school in the Southwest and that she had to work in white people's home during cleaning their houses and doing their laundry. So these are not like way long time ago. These are stories that we hear from our own family members or that we have heard. And this is one of the things that keeps us enduring is knowing those stories. Another federal policy called inculcation of patriotism in Indian schools was intended to imbue native children with patriotism and loyalty to the United States while carefully avoiding any unnecessary reference to the fact that they are Indians. When our people continued to be native in spite of all of those efforts, more desperate actions were called for in the 1950s. One of those actions, one that hit Oregon especially hard and California, was a 1953 national policy for the eventual termination of the federal government's relationship with tribes, doing away with the legal status of tribes without regard to treaties or other commitments. I will discuss this in the context of my own tribe. The Klamath Termination Act was passed on August 13, 1954. Termination had been characterized as a cost-saving measure, but the Klamath tribes were already financial, financially self-sufficient as a tribe because we had the largest stand of virgin ponderosa pine. 
certainly in the West and maybe in the world. Nevertheless, Senator Watkins, the strongest congressional advocate for termination, characterized termination as on-the-spot freedom. Contrary to more than half a century of inac inaccurate reporting, Klamath tribal members were not allowed to vote on termination. And most of the tribes that were terminated were given some kind of vote. Klamath tribes were allowed to vote after it was, the deed was done. As a result, everything the tribe owned was privatized and sold. This included our 860,000 acre reservation, which was condemned and purchased by the United States government. You may know our reservation as the Wainema National Forest. As was the case with Senator Frelinghuysen and the Indian Removal Act, there were non-natives who sought termination and the liquidation of the Klamath Reservation for the disaster that it turned out to be, both for our people and for our homeland. Among them were the Portland Oregonian, the Klamath Falls League of Women Voters, NBC News on the NBC News Hour, A.H. Wright, who was the current director of Indian Education for Oregon, and many individuals from throughout the United States who learned about the effort to take away the reservation and engaged in a letter writing campaign. And I think this is something, as, as a Klamath person myself, it's important that we know that there are people out there who are not native, who do something just because it's the right thing to do, who see something that's wrong. And um, we get so used to fighting our own fights all by ourselves that we sometimes don't notice that there are people who are waiting to be helpful. So I just like to give these people from the past credit. And um, when I was doing research in the archives in, up in Seattle, I would run across those letters, and um, what is, there was a Christian magazine, or newspaper, that was big in the 50s, and they published articles, and, and these incredible church ladies, really, they just got busy and wrote their letters, and even though it didn't change anything, just like Senator Freeling Heisen's um, speech didn't change it, it helps to know that they tried. It helps to know that they cared. And I gave a presentation a few, about a year and a half ago uh, for, for my tribe, and a young woman who was there whose father had been very involved in uh, helping our tribe pull back together was in tears afterward because she never knew that anyone cared. And it makes a difference to know that people care. Termination con and condemnation of our reservation is a loss that our hearts have never fully recovered from, but it has not caused such despair that we have forgotten who we are. Another question I posed in my write-up for this presentation was, how have so many Native people adapted but still managed to sustain a distinct tribal entity? Identity, <laughs> entity, sorry about that. Um, Again, I will refer to my own tribe from my personal perspective. And I, I do want to be clear, this is Kathy Hill's uh, perception of things. Not everybody on my tribe would see things the same way. But this is my personal perspective. First, if we know who we are, we can get through pretty much anything. Second, we are connected to our homeland, our fellow tribal citizens, and our shared history even though we sometimes haven't yet learned the specifics of that history. These are constant reminders that we don't need others to affirm us. Not your kind of Indian, too bad, so sad. Our homeland, our people, and our families affirm us. That's home. That's the view out my bedroom window. So speaking for myself, I am now in the fortunate situation to see this mountain almost every day. It comforts me as I reflect on what it has observed over the millennia. It sounds corny, but a few weeks ago when I was dealing with a personal concern, I was reminded of what that mountain has seen. I told my husband, 
we really are the children of this land. There is no getting around the fact that this land has sustained our people and provided all that we needed for many millennia. I lived away from home for many years, but I was fortunate to have been taught who I was at an early age. When you have been gifted like that, you carry your tribe and your homeland in your heart. Before I move on, however, it is important to acknowledge that, not, that many Native people, including many Klamath Modoc or Yehuskan Paiute individuals, struggle to survive every day. Historica, okay, historical trauma is real. Sorry, didn't expect this. <laughs> Boarding school, forced assimilation, the federal government's unilateral, unilateral abrogation of our treaty, the resulting diminishment of our legal and social status as Indians, the loss of our reservation, and ongoing deprivation has taken and continues to take a heavy toll on our tribe and many tribal citizens. So I have talked a lot about the past, but I am also concerned about the present and future. In the write-up for this presentation, I asked, how can non-Natives support the inherent right of Native people to be self-determining? In my personal opinion, it is all about respect. And Eliza's in a little bit of trouble with me because she stole some of my thunder, but I'll go on anyway. As I said earlier, history matters. Acknowledging the past is important. A little over a year ago, Governor Bill Walker of Alaska made the following apology to Alaska Natives. I apologize to you, Alaska's first people, for the wrongs that you have endured for generations. For being forced into boarding schools, I apologize. For being forced to abandon your native language and adopt a foreign one, I apologize. For erasing your history, I apologize. For the generational and historical trauma you have suffered, I apologize. This apology is long overdue. It is but one step in hundreds more to go on this journey towards truth, reconciliation, and healing. This past June, Governor Gavin Newsom of California apologized for the state's historical treatment of California natives, referring to it as genocide. No other way to describe it, and that's the way it needs to be described in the history books. Words are nice, but as we all know, actions speak louder. Just three weeks ago, the city of Eureka, California returned a small island a sacred site where Wiat people were massacred in 1860 to the Wiat tribe. The city had returned 40 acres to the Wiat 15 years earlier. I would like to see some of our homelands return to each of the tribes in Oregon, but there are things I would also like to see as we move through the 21st century. I would like non-natives to respect us by acknowledging that Native nations are sovereign and have been sovereign for thousands of years, many millennia longer than the United States and the individual states. Our sovereignty is inherent. It wasn't bestowed by any other entity. Not having a treaty, not having a relationship with the federal government doesn't mean we're not sovereign. Those unrecognized tribes have inherent sovereignty. It's hard to do anything with it, they don't have any resources, they're not acknowledged, but the United States does not give tribes sovereignty. That is inherent. The next one, and Eliza already addressed this, uh, learn about the native people who lived in your area at first contact. If their descendants are no longer there, find out why, preferably from the native people themselves. Many tribes have a website that includes some tribal history. Next, teach your children and grandchildren the history of the native people for whom your location is an aboriginal homeland. Respect our homelands. Whether we live there or not, we, we recognize a responsibility 
to provide stewardship for those lands and resources. If you can, support Native people when you are asked to do so and when you value what we value. Recognize that we may take different approaches to address some issues. Please respect our right to do so. Don't assume you know more or are wiser than the Native people who are involved in a cause. Respect the right of Native people to engage in Native-led movements. The Dakota Access Pipeline seems like a good example. Natives led the fight and others joined and supported. Support our right to elect our own governments. Tribal government and tribal politics vary from tribe to tribe, and the roles of tribal leaders differ. Educate yourself and respect our processes. And not to be offensive, though I know it is, except that sometimes you just need to mind your own business. We have a lot to work through after more than 100 years of oppression. As Vine Deloria Jr. once wrote, Indians need a leave us alone law. Or as my mom used to say, and probably some of your moms too, when I want your opinion, I'll ask for it. Sep Ketcha, thank you very much. Thank you so much. We're going to take questions from the audience, and I just want to thank everyone for your patience in uh, bearing with us on this extremely busy weekend, which is wonderful but unusual. So I hope everyone could hear today. And if you couldn't, just remember this is being recorded, and you'll have an opportunity to go back and re-listen. Uh, but for now, questions from the audience? Yes. Okay. Um, I was just curious what state the senator in 1954 represented? New Jersey. Why did he care about the Klamath? No, that wasn't about the Klamath. That was about the Cherokee. He cared about things as a US senator. And he cared about, about what was happening on the East Coast. So that was long before. That was before we uh, even had any visitors that weren't native. Thank you. Thank you for coming all the way from Chilicon, I guess. It's not that far. Yeah. yeah. Um, in any case, <clears throat> when I, I uh, went online and read about your background, I was really excited um, mm. that you had gotten a law degree back in 1994. Um, I guess the first part of the question is, uh, were there many other Native peoples in your class w when you were getting your degree? And if not, how did you handle the, you know, perhaps alienation or at, at least, um, you know, being the sole person? Oh. Uh, <laughs> and secondly, I guess, what do we need to do to encourage more Native peoples to go into areas like law and planning, land use planning, mm -hmm. and all, that's my field, mm -hmm. and I'm not finding many Native people like at PSU uh -huh. going into it. Um, they tend to be taking indigenous studies instead, which is yeah. great, you know, <laughs> but um, I, I think, you know, to deal with the issues you're dealing with, we need other areas. Thank you. Um, well, first I have to say I was not the only Native person in my law school class. Um, and I was almost 40 years old when I went to law school. I, w I went to law school after working on restoration and knowing that I wanted to know more about how these things happened to us. And that's actually why I started doing research in the archives in the first place was my grandma, my dad, other elders in my family could not tell us why. Why did we get terminated? Why were we one of the primary targets? People, it hit so hard and so fast that it just threw everyone. So I started doing the, that research. And then after working on restoration with Bill Ray, among others, Bill Ray, please raise your hand. Bill is, lives in this area, and he was on the Klamath Tribes Restoration Committee and made a solid, solid contribution. Um, 
But after doing that, I had never really cared about a degree. I was, when we, when I taught, taught at Humboldt State, Joseph and I taught there, and I used to tell my students, I'm your parents' worst nightmare, because it took me forever to get an undergrad degree, because I really didn't see the relevance. And then after working on restoration, I wanted to go to law school, so I had to finish my, <laughs> my undergrad degree. And um, there were a number of Native, I went to University of Washington, which has had a very strong law program for Native students. And um, there were quite a few uh, Natives in there. And, and it really, I remember my, my first uh, quarter and a person who's then become a family friend ever since. But there was another Native student in the class. And we were sitting across this big room from each other. And one of our professors said something. And, and he wasn't, there was nothing wrong with what he said. But he talked about how railroads opened up the heart of America. Well, we know what happened to the buffalo when the railroads came through. We know how many railroads go through Indian country, went through our reservations. And so when he said that, I just kind of went like that in my chair. And he did the exact same thing across the room. So it made a huge difference to have other Native students that you could just talk about things and it wasn't like anti-anybody, it's just like you get a, a feeling and it's very helpful to have somebody to talk about that with. So I was fortunate. There are a lot of natives uh, who practice law now. Um, and, and kind of at the head of things was people going into law. We have more and more native doctors, dentists, um, I don't know if you ever have met Margot Hill from Eastern Washington University. She teaches planning at that university. And I think there, she has a, at least a handful of Native students. So I think that it's, for me certainly, for education is about how is this relevant? What difference does it make? Because I don't, I mean I really didn't just care about getting a degree. But I don't know if that answers your question sufficiently. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Thank you. I wonder, in light of your research on Salido Falls, what is your position on the removal of the three lower Columbia dams, and how can we get involved? <laughs> <laughs> well, I am not informed enough to answer that question about the but you know, the Klamath, we're getting those dams out on the Klamath River. I'm big on dam removal, responsible dam removal, of course. But uh, yeah, and certainly what happened to Celilo is a nightmare, is a horrible injustice. And it was such an abrogation of a highly spiritual place. It's not just about the fish, but um, I think that I mean, if I knew anything, I would say I was in favor of it, but I don't know how to, how to be involved in that particular effort. I've mostly been involved with our Klamath River Dam issues. So sorry, but, but good for you. Um, as an educator of uh, middle school, I'm wondering what ways you might suggest to begin decolonializing the education system, especially with the storied past of how education was used so negatively and so impactfully. Wow. Um, you know, the state of Oregon has passed Senate Bill 13 to teach Native history in the schools. One of my concerns with that, I'm just going to voice this since I have a platform, um, is that, that local schools aren't required to use the local tribes history, they're only required to use the broader one. But I think that a good starting point is just, and I, gee, I, I don't know, I, we did some eighth grade curriculum. Um, I think we talked about the Marshall Trilogy for eighth graders. Part of it is that the students, young people, just don't understand what sovereignty means or why what I, you know, hear, have heard all my life is why should Indians be special? 
there really, there really is this attitude and it's because of the way the education system has worked. And it's, um, so I think that just helping people understand there are distinctions and there are legal distinctions um, is a good place to start. And also having students do projects or reports on specific tribes or even, you know, things like first foods, just to have a better understanding of not only the sovereignty of Native people and the existence of Native people and the, the legal uh, uh, status of Native people, but also it, it's so funny because people talk about uh, Native men being lazy and all they want to do is hunt. I mean, it's like, I mean, our men fed us. You know, and we all had roles. We survived for literally, you know, over 10,000 years, 14,000 years, they estimate in our case, because we had the resources, but you have to work to utilize those resources. So I think that anything that raises student awareness is really important, and also what Eliza was talking about, about learning about the environment they're in and learning about the tribes, that even if they weren't there, that they were there, because it's not like they just decided to pack up and move. You know, they didn't have any choice. And, and I'll say that as a, as a Modoc Klamath person, I feel so fortunate that even though our reservation was taken, we are there. We got to stay in our homeland. That's not true of so many tribes in Oregon, you know, that were removed. So I'm babbling, but um, I think that anything you can do to raise awareness and be respectful and you know, and, and not allow disrespect. But thank you. <laughs> uh, sure, yeah. Um, I, I, this might be an ignorant, ignorant question, but I assume that your tribe it, were, interacts with Oregon and California, is that correct? Like, no. Geography, no? Oh. But I'm glad you raised it because um, one of the terms I hate is Oregon tribes. I hate that term. We're not Oregon tribes because when you say Oregon tribes, that's like we, we're a derivative of the state. We were here long before Oregon was. So I'll just get, I got that one off my chest. Um, but yeah, when the treaty was negotiated, all of the Modoc, most of the Modoc land was in California. But that got lopped off in the negotiations. All, virtually all of the Modoc land was cut off. Most of the Paiute land was cut off. And our reservation is squarely in Klamath territory. But um, so yeah. I, now, my, um, there are things that are happening, though, on, at the tribal level of, uh, my, I mentioned that my son does linguistics, and as a person of Modoc heritage and Modoc Klamath language, there are very few words that differ. It's McLaughlin's for both of them. It's the same language. So he's very involved with the California Indian language folks. So the tribes, or like with the uh, Klamath, uh, River Intertribal Fish and Water Commission. You know, it's everybody on the Klamath River. We're at the Headocks and then, you know, Karoo, Kupa, Yurok. So we have, the tribes have our relationships because those are, you know, just false boundaries. But was there more to that question about interacting with the state? <laughs> I was just curious, like, in terms of activism, like how maybe you have more success in Oregon or California or, or, it doesn't matter, but how that works, you know, like to complicate things, the yeah. way we draw up the boundaries, or if you have experience there, I was kind of curious. I think that, um, I mean, that, that's really interesting, and I think there's a lot to be done, a lot that hasn't been explored, but in terms of like the dam removal, state of California really committed a lot of funding. State of Oregon did too, and I really appreciated Richard Whitman out of the governor's office that worked with us when we were doing that. But the state of California and their voters supported funds that are going towards dam removal. So even though our tribe's not located there, those salmon got to come through there to get home. And we haven't seen a salmon for over 100 years when the dams first started getting built. So I appreciate the state of California for that.
Hi, I'm Hi. sorry, I got lost on my way in, so I get, arrived extremely late. But um, I was talking with a young friend recently, and he brought up that there is an attempt to create a digital library of Alexandria, okay? Have you ever heard of this, and would you like to be a part of it? And if the answer is yes, is there anybody in the audience that can help that union? I don't know what that is. This, anybody else? So uh, the Library of Alexandria was one of the world's largest repositories of knowledge in history, and it was burned. And so there are young people who would like to recreate that sort of library in the digital world. And I'd like to see your history be part of that uh, library. I can tell you we have a digital collections of Oregon Historical Society materials that we encourage people to check out. Are there other questions? Really? Okay. <laughs> Hi there. I try to be sensitive as a non-native of making others do emotional labor, but as an advocate, can you perhaps help define um, when advocacy slides into centering a different narrative? How can we as advocates to help boost the signal of what natives need right now without making it about ourselves? Wow. Didn't I have a list? No, I'm kidding. Um, no, I, I think that's a really important question because in the, even working on restoration, I, I just tell this, there was a local minister and he had seen movements in other places and he somehow wanted to kind of like be our savior. And it's really hard not to get in that role or appear to get in that role. And I think the people just, I mean, I have to myself say, Kathy, this isn't about you. I mean, I have to do that multiple times because I'm always, you know, getting my nose in wherever. And, and I think that just being aware of that possibility makes it much less likely to happen and, and offering assistance is different than questioning. And it is really, partly maybe because people have more experience. There's a tendency to start advising about how things should be done. But, you know, it, it becomes much weaker um, as soon as that happens. I'm sorry, I'm thinking about, what's the, what's this Kevin Costner movie? Dances with Wolves, yeah. You know, natives get kind of tired of everybody wants to be the, you know, <laughs> hero that comes in from the outside. But on the other hand, native people need support. There may be things that, that you, I mean, I feel like everybody has a skill to offer, um, whatever it is, and as long as the ego's kept in check, I think that offering your skills when something comes up and people are looking for help is, is very valuable. And with our restoration effort, it wasn't just all native. You know, we counted on people who had other skills that we didn't have, who had connections that we didn't have, and sometimes just introducing people to each other. So I, th I mean, I think that probably it's not an issue for someone like you who thinks about it first <laughs> before you dive in. Is there another hand? Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, there's a map um, of, that um, covers some of the Klamath area right behind you, I though I suspect <laughs> that many of the audience it's uh, actually blocked by the podium for. But uh, I was wondering if um, you are advocating for return of some lands to uh, the Klamath tribes. It, can you show us on the map at all where? And, and like, um, you know, where, are these publicly or privately owned or? Um, well, yeah. Quite frankly, I think we take most anything that's within our aboriginal territories. Um, I mean, going from nothing to something is a, a big movement. We've made many efforts. We tried to buy some land a few years ago, 
and uh, that didn't work out. We negotiated for some land with our when we had a water agreement that actually our tribal members supported, but our congressman did not, and that would have been included the return of 90,000 acres plus we would still have enough water for our fish. Um, we will never stop trying to get some land back. There is nothing that hardly means more to us than having a homeland that we can actually protect. We work, we have uh, some very strong relationships, not always, we aren't always in agreement, but we have had some very good natural resources staff and so we've been very active um, in helping to protect our resources. One of the fortunate things is when we were terminated, when our federal, relationship, federal government relationship was terminated, is we did not lose our treaty right to hunt, fish, trap, and gather. And so on all public lands, we can do that. Unfortunately, so can everybody else. And so a lot of game was wiped out a lot of our resources have been wiped out. A lot of the land has been mismanaged. And that brings about its own kind of hurt because we know when the Creator placed us there, that responsibility came with it. That land took care of us for those many millennia. And it's our responsibility to do what we can to take care of it. So fortunately, when Congress wrote that legislation, we had to fight the state of Oregon. The states and tribes are sometimes work well together and sometimes we don't. That's longstanding. And the state of Oregon opposed our right to continue to exercise our treaty rights, but we won. We won at Ninth Circuit and it didn't get, you know, it didn't get heard at, at the Supreme Court. And the same thing with our water rights. The way the termination was written, Termination Act, they didn't, what I've been told, and I have not documented it, so this is just hearsay, is that the powers that be didn't want to have to pay us for that water. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. Because we continue to have water rights. But also they're in-stream flow water rights. We don't have a right to divert. We don't have a right to use it for irrigation. But we have a right to use it to protect the resources. To provide water for the animals that need it. To provide water for the fish. So uh, not enough water for the birds. Our bird populations have really diminished. But you know, every little, every little thing that we can do to take responsibility for our homeland, to keep it healthy, to, you know, reciprocity is a big thing in, in native values. You don't just take, take, take. Um, you, you give when you practice, you know, I mean, it sounds <laughs> a little new agey. You know, you practice gratitude. You appreciate what you have. You don't take it for granted because if you take it for granted or if you take too much, you're not going to have any more. There's a reason that our people survived as long as they did. And that's what I see that we have in common with a lot of other people who want to live that way, you know, without just taking everything. And certainly, and, and that's one of the, I, I wrote so many versions <laughs> before I decided what to say. And, and you can never say everything you want to, but it's just sad that people are honored and, and I realize they provide paychecks, but that companies can destroy whole areas and it's okay because of money. So I think that, um, yeah, I mean, if we, the more we can do to protect our homeland, the better. And the better for all of our neighbors because it's not just about us. We now have, you know, we all have neighbors. And if we're not all in it together, it's just going to be destroyed. So, soapbox. Thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, tribal membership um, versus, you know, tribal and Native American identity? Because um, I'm not always clear about how the membership process works and um, so I mean each tribe has a different set of you know um, expectations or uh, identity for tribal membership so I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit about that yeah this is one of the most controversial areas that we deal with within ourselves 
because tribes have the right to set the criteria for membership. And, um, and it all you know, started with the federal government in terms of blood quantum. And that's what it's usually based on. And you have to have enough blood quantum of a particular tribe, tribe to be enrolled in that tribe as a tribal citizen. Um, now, as so many people met, um, the people they married at boarding schools, because Indians were sent from all over. And so people married people from other tribes. And that's always been the case, but it increased you know, even then. But then now we have some people who are ending up, you know, marrying somebody that they're related to uh, because our societies have broken down so people don't know they're related for one thing, but also they want their kids to be enrolled. And so they want them to have enough blood quantum. And so it, it is very tangled, but tribes set their own criteria for membership. And I think it's critical. And I know like for us with our tribal clinic, you know, where people can go for medical help, uh, children and grandchildren who aren't enrolled are still eligible for some services. So it's different all across the board on different things, but um, my brother is a medical doctor. He's retired now, but he's a uh, multiple past president of Association of American Physi Indian Physicians and they reached a point where they started requiring people to prove, um, prove their Indian ancestry to be enrolled members of tribes. And it's interesting how it works because when we were terminated, or when our federal recognition was terminated and the federal government said we weren't Indians anymore, um, he was in medical school and he wanted to do an internship with Seattle Indian Health Board and he couldn't do an internship as a Klamath because we weren't federally recognized. But we also have the Big Pine Numu, the uh, Paiute ancestry from Owens Valley. They said, oh, well, you can do an internship because of that ancestry, even though he wasn't enrolled there. And, and it's one of the most divisive things that we have to deal with because there are people who are more than half. In fact, I knew some kids that were, I mean, now they're adults, but. They're, they were half, but they were four different tribes. Each tribe required a quarter, so they, they couldn't be enrolled. They were four-eighths, but they were an eighth of four different tribes, so they didn't meet the criteria. So it's a, it's a very uh, complex issue, and it can be a very emotional issue. And... Um, I don't know if that helps understand, helps under, or explain anything. But yeah, it is very complex. But I think it's, people can lots of times find out if they have native ancestry, not by those DNA tests. That, <laughs> that's not helpful, but really, there are so many records available. But there were also times of generations of people tried not to let people know they were native because of how natives were treated or opportunity that would be shut off. And now their descendants have trouble going back and proving their ancestry. Yeah, complex stuff. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you very much for your talk. It was uh, fabulous. Uh, my name is John and I'm from Canada. Uh -huh. And um, I have recently had the opportunity and privilege to work on the history of what we call First Nations, uh -huh. uh, with First Nations in British Columbia. But one of the things that's come up is that um, <clears throat> prior uh, to the boundary being drawn between Canada and the United States, uh, all of the territory on the West Coast was under joint uh, control of the United States and the British. Um, and it was only in 1846 with the signing of the Treaty of Oregon, that colonial sovereignty was actually asserted uh, over the West Coast. And so I'm just wondering, is there any knowledge or discussion of that? Um, in Canada there is because a number of the First Nations, um, the uh, Macaw Band on the Olympic Peninsula, part of the Nuchalneth 
group. We're divided by that boundary that went through uh, the Straits of Juan de Fuca. Uh -huh. Uh, and also uh, the um, Wasanich peoples were divided from the Lummi peoples. Yeah. And so that border is not really recognized, right? It's yeah. seen as a f colonial border. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if that is part of Klamath sort of history as well, or uh, uh, if it is in case of other uh, Native American uh, tribes in Oregon or in Washington. Wow, Joseph, do you think you could say more about that than me? Because, I mean, certainly along uh, the Canadian border all the way across the United States, and also the border with Mexico. I mean, some of the tribes have, are, are citizens of both nations and can freely cross back and forth. But I don't know about the specific issue that you're talking about. Do you know anything more? Oh, you can. <laughs> I can speak a little bit to that. Um, in doing some of the, the historical research for uh, the Klamath tribe, we're looking at some of the ancient, in a sense, laws and rules that uh, came about in the division of Oregon Territory from Canada and the United States and how that worked out. And <clears throat> there's some uh, legal precedent associated with how that worked. Um, in colonial times, when a, div a division of property or territory was made. It was along the, the rivers that made the borders. So originally, when they were negotiating with Canada and the United States, where would that border be? It would be the Columbia River. And so what happened was that would have put all of the, the Washington state basically in Canada under British control. Um, in the process of negotiating, they decided to just extend that line all the way across the top and then make the state of uh, Juan de Fuca the border when you get to the coast. But those are artificial boundaries, and the tribes on both sides of the, those uh, artificial lines have relationships back and forth. And you can see that, particularly in the, in the eastern portion of the United States, where they have border crossings that go back and forth between the United States and Canada and dual citizenship. Same thing in, in uh, the border between Mexico and the United States, particularly in the Southwest. The tribes go back and forth, and they have actually doors or fence openings where the tribes go back and forth. So the tribes themselves don't recognize those borders specifically as denying their tribalism. But the United States does, because the, the United States has control or jurisdiction of all those border areas, and the same thing for Canada. So internationally, that's the problem that have to be dealt with between the international rules, regulations, and so forth. And that also affected the, the treaty, um, fish treaties and the Pacific coast of the salmon because the United States through the Department of State represents the tribes. So the tribes can't even talk to each other in regards to these issues with Canada and, uh, and others. So there have been some re revisions of how that works by joining the tribes with the Department of State in the negotiation teams. So you have to just play those, those rules and try to see how it'll work and how you can do things. But the original boundary wasn't supposed to be that border. It was supposed to be the rivers. So they redrew whole areas. And, and there is a historical um, document in, uh, uh, was it uh, the uh, oh, the uh, Guggenheim? Okay, Guggenheim the, uh, 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 Library, where you can go online, and there's how the that was how that occurred because there's a history of the Oregon territories, and it's just written out, and there's very legal response in there that was really helpful, and you can see those things happen all the time between sovereign nations of Europe trying to see how they're going to split up the world. So that, and that's what they were doing, splitting up the world and all the indigenous people or people who were there already had nothing to say about it because they were discovered. So, I should never have called on him. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Dupree. <No. laughs> like, well, it sounds like fascinating work. I don't know that much about it, but I, I do think that it's remarkable how tribes are coming back and reclaiming 
what they knew to be right in the first place. So great that you're working with them. Thank you. I think we're going to wrap up for now, but we'll let folks have, there may be an opportunity for individual questions. What's that? question is, do you support the census for Native people, the 2020 census? Yes, I do. But I also, and I think it's important, people need to know this. One of the things we learned in Chiloquin is, I mean, so many of us in the Northwest are mixed blood. And if people put mixed, then they don't count as Natives. And that funding for Native uh, projects doesn't come to that community. So it's really interesting to me that uh, it's like kind of uh, people are expected to shut out whatever else it is. So, you know, just mark what, what our uh, approach has been is just mark, mark native and, what, and put down your tribe. And don't try to over explain because it'll just get, I know it sounds really cynical, it'll just get used against us. <laughs> okay. The, the voice of experience, I think, there. We're so glad to have you both here with us today. Thank you for taking the time. And I want to let folks know to please take advantage of all of our resources online, the journal, the exhibit um, upstairs. Go visit today and again and again. Uh, for folks who are members or who are interested in membership, uh, the Oregon Historical Quarterly is a benefit of membership. We're wrapping up the issue that will come out in December right now. It'll be a big special issue on the history of white supremacy and resistance in Oregon. So uh, one not to miss, uh, put that, uh, make sure to get that. And I also wanna let folks know that next week, same place, same time, is our last program in this Experience Oregon series. Mario Safuentes and Lynn Steven will be speaking about the deep history of Latino activism in Oregon. So come check that one out as well. Thank you all so much for being here.